Well, again, I am Pastor Chris. We welcome you. We are glad that you are here. Today we are starting a new sermon series. You can see it up there on the screen. You might have seen it on Facebook. And frankly, I'm excited to share this series with you. And I pray that you will get a lot out of it and that it will perhaps, hopefully, transform your relationships. And I believe that God, through the power of the Holy Spirit given to us by Christ Jesus, can and will use these sermons and in this series to challenge us and to change us if we will allow it to. And with with all seriousness, uh, if you miss a week, I would encourage you, I would even challenge you, if you miss a week of this series, go online and watch it. Uh, Get caught up. Don't miss out. Because each one of the components, one builds to the next, and and it's a process of of peacemaking, and you'll understand by the end what that all means. And, And I think it's important that you get each one of the components so that you are fully equipped to live this out in your life and in your faith. And the ideas that we're going to be covering over the next few weeks, um, they're all biblical principles straight from the Bible, but the first place that I kind of encountered them in this way and fashion was uh, through a book by a a lawyer by the name of Ken Sandy. He's a Christian lawyer, lives in Montana, practices law there. And I encountered those through a class that I had in seminary. And in life, maybe you're like me, I I love to read. And if you've seen my library in the office, you know I have lots of books, and I used to have many, many more than that, as hard as that might be for some of you to believe. But I've read a lot of books in my life, and and there are certain books that impact you much more than others, and you may remember some of your own life, and I could rattle off a list of a handful that were very influential on me, but few books have ever had such a, just, just a profound impact on me, particularly in my faith walk, as this particular book did back when I was in seminary. I was I was not expecting much and was completely overwhelmed and blown away uh, by Ken Sandy's book titled The Peacemaker. And so with that as kind of the background, that's where I'm going to be drawing a lot of this from. If you want to go deeper on any of this, um, you can get the book, certainly. They offer trainings. Kim and I probably... 12 years ago went to a peacemaker training when we used to live in the Twin Cities and I've gone to a couple of other uh, trainings of theirs over the years and just really some tremendous principles and ideas that come from that. So that that book serves as the inspiration for this whole series and if you want more we can point you in the right direction. They've got a whole peacemaker ministries website with all sorts of other additional resources. Useful not just in your Christian walk, it could be useful in your business or in your school or wherever you might be. And as I preach through this today, you'll kind of hear there's two parts to this sermon. It's going to start off kind of up in the head with the heady intellectual level kinds of stuff. And then in the second part of the sermon, you'll see we're going to move kind of more into the practical, live it out, kind of heart knowledge kinds of things. So with that, let us just jump into the deep end and hop into 1 Corinthians 10. There are Bibles in the chairs if you need one. You're welcome to use an iPad or iPhone or Android, whatever you've got, and There are Bibles out in the Welcome Center as well if you would need one of those. And we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, not exclusively, but mostly for the rest of today, 10 and 11 there. Now, if you don't know, the Apostle Paul wrote a couple of different letters to the church at Corinth. And he spent a fair bit of time working with those men and women there. And, And this church in Corinth is famous for their problems. If I had to summarize First and Second Corinthians for you, and I've said this in many contexts before, I would simply say these two letters that Paul writes to the church in Corinth can be summarized as such. Hey, you knuckleheads, knock it off. That's not what I taught you. Live out the gospel I gave you. I mean, that, I just summarized two whole books of the Bible there for you. You're welcome. Okay, were you taking notes? There'll be more later. But, but that, I mean, that, that literally is what Paul says to these folks. Because of all of their bad behaviors, and if you read Corinthians, there's some bad behaviors in there. I mean, there's some weird stuff. Because of their bad behaviors, there was a lot of division. There was a lot of conflict within the Corinthian church. Now, one of the things that they did argue over, one of the things that they had a fight over, was whether or not Christians should eat food that may have been offered as a sacrifice to idols. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10.31, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Paul there is urging the, the Corinthians that no matter what it is that you're doing, they should seek to glorify God in it, in all of it, whatever, he says, in everything, even in conflict. 
Yes, as Christ followers, we need to have conflict in God-honoring ways. That's actually part of our mission. That mission will take us down a very much different path than the glorifying self I directed. As we try to glorify God in all things, including in our conflict, it leads us in an entirely different direction to a completely different destination than what the world would have for us. So how then do we glorify God? Well, first, if you're taking notes, we glorify God by honoring his reputation. See, the word for glory, I mean, we're Glory Baptist Church, right? The word for glory in 1 Corinthians 10.31 is the Greek word doxa. And that word can mean glory or honor or reputation or praise. You may have heard of a doxology, right? Roy was just trying to show me one in the, in the lobby, praise God from whom all snow falls, right? Have you seen that one on Facebook? Yeah? That, that one? But, you know, praise God from whom all blessings flow, or the glory of Patri, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. I used to lead a liturgical church, as you could tell. And uh, I could sing you all kinds of doxologies, believe me. We used them every single week in my last church. I sang them for eight straight years. And, and doxology, doxa, glory, honor, reputation, praise. The doxologies are simply just songs that are formulaic praise. We bring God glory by praising Him, by honoring Him, by, by upholding His reputation in the midst of whatever life brings us, including in the middle of conflict. When we get into a conflict, usually our very first question that we ask is, how is this going to affect my reputation? Right? How does this make me look? What are people going to say about me? The Apostle Paul wants us to ask, how does this affect God's reputation? How does this make God look? How can I act so that others would admire Jesus? For example, maybe you have a coworker who sends a harsh text or an email, and not only sends it to you, but sends it to your whole team. And if, if your team knows about this, right, and, and they know that you're a Christian you then have an opportunity to honor Christ's reputation. Because they're wondering, are you going to fire back? Are you going to send something angry back at them, right? Or maybe you'll find the truth in that email. Because sometimes, while worded harshly, there's a truth in there. Maybe, instead of responding in kind, you respond humbly and apologize. Or maybe that other person is just off base and they're wrong, but instead of getting defensive, you call them person to person. Or you go to them face to face and you explain yourself. Or how about this? What if the, the cashier rings you up wrong at the grocery store? What do you do there? People are watching. What if the opposing team at your kids' or your grandkids' games are playing dirty? How are you going to respond, right? You see, conflict gives us the opportunity to honor Christ with how we handle ourselves. We glorify God by honoring His reputation. Now, we also glorify God by seeking out what is best for others. Paul, as he writes to the Corinthians, he says to them, that they should eat meat sold that's sold in the market, or meat that's been offered to them at somebody's home, even if those people are non-believers, and do so without asking if it had been used as an offering to idols. We see that in verses 25 through 27. But if they do find out that the meat was offered to an idol, then they shouldn't eat it. Okay, so, so this is kind of one of those don't ask questions, but if you already know the answer, then you shouldn't eat it. Right? But if you don't ask questions and you don't know, you can legitimately just go ahead and eat it and don't worry about it. There's nothing actually wrong with, with what Paul is telling him to do. There's nothing wrong with this eating of the meat, but the act of knowingly eating the food that was offered to idols was an act that was considered to be accepting of that idol itself. So if another Christian or, 
or even a non-Christian sees them eating it, it could cause them confusion. So Paul says that they can go ahead and eat the meat as long as it doesn't offend another person, person's conscience. Verses 29 and 30. And it's within that context that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 32 through 33, Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I tried to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, Paul says, but the good of many. Why? So that they might be saved. See, the principle here is put others' needs before our own. Today we are looking at these verses in the context of conflict in our own lives. But I don't want you to think about this just abstractly. Because here's the deal. We live in a broken, sinful world. And because of that, we have the opportunity to glorify God through conflict that we experience each and every day. See, conflict always provides an opportunity for us to glorify God, to bring Him the praise and the honor that He deserves by showing who that God is, what that God is like, and what it is that God is doing in our lives. The best way to glorify God when we have conflict in our lives is to is within that to depend upon God's grace. To draw attention to His grace for us. And then to extend that grace. To share that grace. To give that grace to other people. Grace is undeserved love. It's mercy, it's forgiveness, it's, it's strength and it's wisdom that God has given us through Jesus Christ. And we are all called as Christ's followers to pass that on to other people, even if we don't think they deserve it. And if we do this, God will be glorified. That's exactly what grace is. And as we share this grace, seeking what is best for others, we bring God the glory in that process. And another way that we glorify God is by imitating Jesus. Corinthians 11.1 1 says this. Paul writes, Follow my example as I follow the example of of Christ. The Greek word for follow is mimetes. Kind of like the word mime, right? To mimic. You ever seen a good mime? I mean, everybody kind of jokes that we all hate mimes. But if you've seen a good mime, a good mime is fantastically entertaining. I mean, they, they just do amazing things and, and just, you know, I'm not even going to try because I'm not good at it. But you know, like pretending there's a glass wall or whatever it is they do. Very, very entertaining. And, and we, as we, we try to live out, as we try to step in the footsteps of God who's gone before us through Jesus Christ, as we try to imitate Jesus, we're to copy the life of Jesus. You see, Jesus was very interesting. He responded to people in very different ways. He responded to people in different situations and different styles. Now think about this. Think how did Jesus respond to the sins of the tax collector, to the sins of the prostitute? What did he do with them? He was known as a man who liked to hang out with the drunks, right? He spent time with them, teaching them about who God was, telling them of God's love for them. But then on the other hand, Jesus aggressively confronted the self-righteous Pharisees. He went right into the face of those who thought they were experts in the law. You see, sometimes Jesus will want us to be silent. See, Jesus was silent on his way to the cross, not putting up a fight, because he knew that by going to the cross, he would further the kingdom of God in this world. And if it would further the kingdom of God in this world, he was willing to do what it took. He was willing to stay silent if that's what was needed. He knew that was the right call in that moment. 
But at the very same time, Jesus didn't have some sort of martyr complex. He didn't, didn't feel noble because of his suffering, nor did he desire to avoid conflict. He did not ever. He went to the cross to save sinners. Now other times, he does want us to speak up. He might call us to sacrifice what makes us comfortable and go and address a problem face to face in person because that action will further God's kingdom. And so we will glorify God as we imitate Christ. Now it's the gospel that gives us this desire to glorify God. As the Holy Spirit applies the gospel to our hearts, it is He who gives us this desire to glorify God in all things, including our conflict. How many of you have ever seen, this is one of my all-time favorite shows, the, the BBC series Sherlock. Benedict Cumberbatch, right? The guy who's been in like every movie for the last three or four years now, really exploded on the scene through this series of Sherlock. It started on PBS, and I think it moved somewhere else. I don't remember, but uh, anyhow, if you've not seen it, amazing storytelling. And of course, Sherlock features Dr. Watson and Sherlock. And in one season, there's a female character who literally jumps in front of a bullet to save Sherlock's life. When Watson tells Sherlock that it's not his fault... Sherlock says back to him, that's not the issue. Sherlock is struggling with what has happened. Because, and I quote him, he says, in saving my life, she has conferred a value on it. It's a currency I don't know how to spend. Her sacrifice helps change Sherlock from the inside out. He's quite a quirky character if you've seen the show. And Jesus conferred value on our lives when he died for us. As we come to understand that value, it changes us. As we begin to appreciate what that is, appreciate the gospel... Appreciate how Jesus paid the ultimate price, not just to forgive us, but to make us holy. It changes our desires. God, through Christ, put me first. Now I want to put others first. Christ died for me. Now I want to die death to my own selfishness. Christ gave away His own rights. Therefore, so too can I. The gospel gives us the desire to glorify God. So as I said, we started off with the heady stuff. Now to the heart stuff. How, how do we do this? I mean, it all sounds great, Pastor, but how do I live this out? How do I glorify God in conflict with other people? I mean, I can glorify God when things are going good. I can glorify God when the sun's up. I can glorify God when I'm petting my puppy because that makes me happy. But how do I glorify God when I'm angry at somebody? Right? Well, first, trust God. The first way I want to focus on bringing glory to God through conflict is that we can and should trust God in the middle of it. Instead of relying on our own abilities, on our own ideas as we respond to people, ask God to give you the grace to depend on Him and to follow His ways even if they are completely the opposite of what you feel like doing. And that can be hard when we're angry. But you see, Jesus spoke of this often, didn't He? Sometimes, we will have to turn the other cheek. And that can be tough in the moment. Sometimes, we don't have to forgive seven times, but how many? Seventy times seven. Not that you need to keep track. We have to trust that Jesus has forgiven our sins, confess them freely to Him, and then in that, be liberated by it, and then from that, be forgiving of others. And then believe that God is great enough to use that conflict in our lives to help us grow and to learn to cooperate with Him. 
We have to learn to depend on the assurances that we are given by the Word of God in Scripture, knowing that God is always watching over us. And we need to stop fearing what others might do to us. Know that Jesus delights in displaying His transformative powers through your life. And with this love that Jesus shares with us, through that we can then attempt to do things that we never would have believed we could accomplish on our own strength, such as forgiving someone who has hurt us deeply. Folks, there is no sin that is too great for God to forgive you. And if that is true, and it is, we must draw on that forgiveness and then pass it along in grace to others in our lives who have hurt us, who have wounded us lied to us, lied about us, stabbed us in the back, cheated us, caused us harm and pain. It could be a child who's rebelling, a spouse who left you, a business partner who cheated you, somebody who said bad things about you. It could be many different things, anything that causes you pain in a relationship. What is that pain for you? Who have you had conflict with? We all have it. None of us are immune. It's a product of sin. We have all been hurt. The question is, how are you going to deal with it? Are you going to harbor bitterness and allow it to continue to haunt you, to drag you down, to keep you from being all that Jesus wanted you to be? I say give it up. Set it free. Learn to forgive. Even when you don't want to. Even when it hurts to. Learning to forgive in times like this will show people the power of God in your life is real. And it will bring great glory to God. The second way that I want to focus on bringing glory to God through our conflicts, is that we can and should obey God. One of the most powerful ways that we can glorify God is simply to do as He commands. Jesus tells us in John 15, 8, This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Obeying God's commands without compromise honors Him by showing that His ways are absolutely good, that His ways are absolutely wise, and that His ways are dependable. And our obedience, our willingness to obey, also demonstrates that He is worthy of our deepest love and our devotion. Jesus also said in the book of John, He said, If you love me, you will obey what I command. If you want to honor Jesus and show that He is worthy to be loved more than anything else in this world, then you have to learn to obey His commands. And then the third thing that we can do in bringing God glory through our conflict in life is we need to learn how to imitate God. A great example of this comes from the believers in the book of Ephesians. See, these believers were struggling with some conflict. And the Apostle Paul gave them this timeless advice in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Paul says, be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children, live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. You see, Paul knew that imitating Jesus in the middle of a conflict was the surest path to restoring peace and unity with those who opposed us. And even more important, when we live out the gospel in our lives, we we mirror Jesus' humility, His mercy, His forgiveness, His loving correction. And as we do that, we surprise the world, and we give the world concrete evidence of God's presence and power in our lives. Have you ever been forgiven unexpectedly? Man, is there power in that. Forgiven by someone you hurt? 
Maybe forgiven even before you asked for forgiveness. You know how that feels? It's amazing. It's humbling. It's inspiring. Forgiving others truly models Jesus' love for us. And I can't overemphasize that. Forgive when it isn't expected, and you will be amazed at the doors that God will open for you. Show grace. The world needs more of it, because the world needs more of Jesus. And then the fourth thing that we can do, and it builds on this third one, is that we need to acknowledge God. You see, as God gives you the grace to respond in conflict, as God gives you grace to respond in ways that are unfamiliar to the world, people will take notice. And they will wonder how and why it is you responded so differently. And this creates special opportunities to breathe grace into other people by telling them it is God who has been working in your heart to change you, to help you do the things you never could have done on your own, including forgiving. By seeing grace in your life, it will create opportunities to share more of your faith with other people. It was through the grace of other people that I came to Christ. By being gracious people, you might get a chance to affect someone else's eternity by offering forgiveness and not furthering conflict. A window or a door might be open to you to share the light of Jesus Christ. Remember, those windows don't necessarily open for long, so take advantage when they come. Make the most of it by pointing straight at Jesus and give Him all of the glory for the change in your life that allows you to forgive others. In every conflict in our life, we have an opportunity to show others what we really think of God. If you want to show your love for God, the love that we're supposed to have with all of our mind, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength, right? Have Matthew 22, 37 commands us. If we want to show this, then, then we have to ask God to help us trust, to help us to obey, to help us imitate Him, and then acknowledge Him, especially when it is difficult to do so. This behavior honors God, and it shows others just how worthy God is of our devotion and our praise. One final thing that's worth noting. Glorifying God will also benefit you. Not just others, but it benefits you. You see, many disputes begin or they grow worse because one side or both sides give in to their emotions, right? And they say or do things that they later regret. You ever done that? Said something in the heat of battle that you just wish your mouth didn't work faster than your brain, right? Most of us have been there and done that. When you focus on trusting, on obeying, on imitating and acknowledging God, you will be less inclined to lash out and let your emotions get the better of you. Psalm 37, 31 says, The law of God is in his heart, and his feet do not slip. As we practice this, we get better at this. It won't feel natural to us at first, but it is worth the effort. The other benefit to a God-centered approach to conflict resolution is that as we focus on this, as we try to glorify God in conflict, it makes us less dependent on the results. Even if others fail to respond positively to our efforts to make peace, you can be comforted with the knowledge that God is pleased with your obedience. That knowledge can be the difference in whether you can persevere through a particularly diff difficult season of life. 
through a particularly difficult situation. How does this look in real life? Well, an example I can think of is the difference in having the ability to love a family member through addiction until they reach the point where they can accept help rather than just abandoning them to their own ways. You can probably think of many other examples. Seeking to please and honor God is a powerful compass for life, especially when we are faced with difficult challenges that life will present us. I am extraordinarily excited to share the rest of this series with you, because it only gets better from here, I promise. And I hope that you will be here with us in the weeks to come. If not, get online and watch them, because I believe that this series will equip us to better deal with conflict in God-honoring ways, and it will enable us then to live out our faith better, to live out our faith in ways that the world will see and wonder why we are different and want to be like us. Let us make much of Jesus even in our conflicts. Amen? Let's pray.